So uh, the essay is due uh, Thursday, and we are keenly awaiting, waiting to see what you make of all this. Um, uh, on, on Thursday, we're not going to pause. We are going to go straight ahead with Nagel's um, what, it is what Is It Like to Be a Bat? A uh, very famous article that's in the um, Chalmers collection. So for Thursday, if you can, um, in addition to you, you know, your intellectual and emotional exhaustion by the time you finish the essay, but um, try to take a look um, anyway at Nagel's What Is It Like to Be a Bat article. Um, next week, Austin and Jackson will take over, and you'll get a quite different perspective on the same issues we've been looking at. Um, today is um, review, so I want to go back over lots of the stuff that we've looked at already, and um, I, I'll try and just rework it, but this is also an opportunity. If there is something, um, some point in the class, say variable realizability or something that has bugged you and you think, I never quite got that, then please regard this as an opportunity to, to raise things that have puzzled you all, all, all along the way. OK? So I, I want to start out by looking again at the Chinese room. Um, the, the, the Chinese room we didn't, um, we went through pretty rapidly at the end of last time. And I want to go back over some points there. And uh, then I'll look at um, the road we took from dualism to functionalism in these first few weeks of the term. And then at, uh, the problem consciousness poses for um, uh, the study of the mind and uh, the notion of representation that these computer guys use when they're um, trying to analyze the functioning of the brain. Actually, I'm just curious about what, what your opinion was as we finished up in the Chinese room last time. Um, so the Chinese room is meant to show that you can't make a computer that understands a language. Um, it's just not possible. So um, I'm just curious, how many of you think that the argument achieves that? You just can't have a computer that understands language. Can you put your hand up if you think that's right? <coughs> um, and can you put your hand up if you think, no, that's not right. Uh, 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 settle or not, you could make a computer that understands language. OK, so the, the no's have it. Yeah, though, I'd say it's about uh, two thirds to a third against the computer guys. Is that? Yeah. OK, yes? Yes. That's right. Did you see Blade Runner? Um, yeah, I mean, it's possible to be, I mean, I don't, actually, I, uh, well, I take that back. I don't wish to spoil anything. But, um, but it's possible to be haunted by the thought, maybe I'm not conscious. Maybe I don't think. Yeah. Maybe I'm just a replica. Yeah. Would you? Uh huh. Wouldn't everything be just the same? <laughs> well, you, you mean if you watch yourself very closely, you might catch yourself out doing something robotic? <laughs> oh, yes, they can't absolutely had the idea of a robot. Yeah. Um, I, can, I can dig it out for next time, actually. There's a passage where they can't absolutely articulates the idea of a robot, something that is physically just like you or me and functions just like you or me, but has no mind associated with it. I mean, if you're a dualist, it's a very natural idea, the idea of a robot. Because you've got all the physical stuff, and you've got a, a mental think bubble, if you see what I mean, associated with it. So you, it's perfectly possible, of course, to have the very same physical stuff, but no think bubble. Well, that's a good question. I mean, two thirds of you think that you can't make a computer that thinks. Are you guys all dualists? Put up your hand if you think there can't. If you if think both, you can't have a, a a computer that understands language, and you're a dualist. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, that's a that's a small fraction, right? Significant but small fraction, <laughs> right? The, the, uh, uh, only one or two people there. Um, okay. Okay, okay. Well, I, I, I want to try and persuade you two thirds guys about the Chinese room. 
I think I think there is maybe something um, um, well actually the, the position I want to come to is a little bit complex but in the first place um, there's something about the level uh, which you describe the room um, that really seems important and many of you guys were raising this last time you can say the whole system understands. You take the whole caboodle, the room, the book, the guy, that, the baskets, all that. That whole thing understands. And I think um, one way to see that there is uh, something right about that is to say, well, uh, consider the personality that is exhibited by the answers coming out of the room. Consider the personality of the guy in the room. He, let us suppose, is a bitter and resentful individual who hates his job. I mean, it's not much of a job, right? Um, and uh, let us suppose he is consumed by resentment and um, um, never thinks anything but um, thoughts um, filled with re uh, uh, the ideas of revenge and bitterness. Um, whereas the answers coming out of the room may radiate wisdom, like may radiate serenity, may radiate a deep understanding and acceptance of the human condition. So when you think about the personality exhibited in the answers coming from the room, that might be quite different to the personality of this guy. And what really matters is the psychology at the level of the whole thing, at the level at which you have a serene, insightful individual. Um, that might be uh, that will be the level at which you have something that understands Chinese. You see what I mean? It's when you move up a level and describe the whole system that you get both the serene individual and something that understands Chinese. So there will be a particular personality exhibited in the responses from the room, and that's going to be quite different to the personality of the individual manipulating the signs. But so far, and if you think about this, what it feels like is you've got here a virtual person. You see what I mean? You've, got, you've kind of generated this personality that um, has the serenity and the wisdom um, and has the understanding of the Chinese. But that's just like a character in a story. It's like the narrator of a novel. You know, sometimes when you're reading a novel, you get a very vivid picture of who the narrator is. You see what I mean? Um, but that narrator need not be a real person. That narrator is just a kind of virtual person. You'd be making a mistake if you suppose that the narrator of the novel must, be, uh, must have the same characteristics as the person who actually wrote it. So thinking about the higher level, you do have a virtual person here. That makes sense. You can it feels like you're talking to someone who understands Chinese, has wisdom, has serenity, and so on. But there's no really such any such person there. And I think in the discussion last time, um, some people said, well, this really has to do with the, um, who wrote the book that is generating the answers. You're re really looking at the personality of the person who wrote the book that is generating the answers. Or else people said, look, it's the actual book that's the key thing. And I think these are important reactions because what you're doing there is you're trying to find the absolutely real thing that could be the personality that understands Chinese and so on. But these are, these are not quite the right answer because it's not, you don't want it to be somebody backstage who wrote the book. And as for writing, saying it's the book itself, then um, uh, Searle's got a really good point about this when he says um, the person in the room could just memorize the book. The person in the room could internalize the whole book still without understanding Chinese. So it seems like a powerful idea that you want to go up a level and talk about the whole system understanding Chinese. But we want to know when you've got that, that whole system constitutes a person that actually does understand Chinese. And that's the thing I kept saying that if you've just got the book and the baskets and the shell of the room, how does that add enough to, the, to, the, to, the, to that poor drudge working through the baskets? How does that add enough for there to be a real person up a level there, not just a virtual person? Do, do you see what I mean? Let me pause. Yep. 
there is the issue whether there is anybody that is the virtual person. Do, do, do you see what I mean? That in when you're reading the responses coming out of the room, they may give you a very vivid picture of who's writing these responses. That's what I mean, I think, about the wisdom and serenity. Or if you don't like that, you can make this um, a terrible drunk who goes through phases um, of lucidity in their answers. Or, you know, you, you, you can have a real personality coming out of those answers. But the question is, is there anybody there who really is that person? Yeah. Isn't this just make-believe? Don't we just have a virtual, a virtual person being generated by the system? You see what I mean? The, if I'm explaining this correctly, that should be plain as day. So, so pause me if that is not plain as day. The computer guy really has to reply to Sarah by going up a level yeah, and say it's the whole system that understands. Sorry? But what makes it the case that when you go up a level, you get a real person and not a virtual person? Does that contrast make sense? Yeah? OK. <laughs> Uh, OK, um, well, a natural, the, the thing is, when you go up a level, you want it to be something that a computer guy could reasonably add on to the computer program and say, that's what it takes to understand. And so it's a natural idea. A lot of people have said, really, you want to embed the Chinese room in a robot. Um, once you've got the whole system moving and acting, in the world, picking up things, um, looking at things around it, then you've got um, um, something that really understands Chinese. But the trouble is that on the face of it, if you just embed the Chinese room in here, well, that is really just a zombie. If you actually encountered such a system, you would say you can be taken in by it. It passes the Turing test but it really doesn't understand anything. The worrying thing for a computer guy is maybe what you really have to add in is something that a computer guy can't model. Maybe what you have to add in is awareness of what's going on around you. I mean, after all, if you think how d the question was, does the system understand the signs it's using? Well, how do you understand the signs you're using? If I say, this is Jackson, this is Austin, how do you know what the words stand for? Well, because you have encountered these people. If I say, you want to know what chalk is? Here is a piece of chalk. Then the reason you understand what I'm saying is you've now experienced the thing that I'm talking about. That's what gives you knowledge of what the word chalk stands for. If I say, this is Jackson, what gives you knowledge of what the word stands for is you've actually experienced that person. So if that's the right answer, if what has to be happening is that you have consciousness of what's outside the room, and that's what underpins your understanding of the language, that's not something that the, the computer um, a simulation guy is going to be able to emulate at all easily. I mean, how could you do that? You say, well, the computer model of the mind is just right. The whole artificial intelligence program is just right. All you've got to add to it to generate understanding of a language is consciousness. There you go. Um, that, that's the problem solved. I mean, it seems perfectly obvious there that the problem is, well, if it's not completely hopeless, it might as well be. I mean, how do you just add that to a computer program? It's not just adding another few lines of code or building a robotic shell. If what you've got to add is awareness, um, then um, the computer guy seems to have made very little progress towards giving you an explanation of what it is to understand a language. But there really is no scientific approach to the analysis of understanding a language other than a computational model. The computational model is the only account we have. So the stakes are very high here as to exactly what you say has to be added to make this whole thing into something that understands language. And there's a connection here to um, Bloch's homunculus headed robot. Bloch said, uh, uh, well, that could, the, a, a homunculus headed robot, I mean, something with a billion individuals driving it about, that could meet the functional description without being conscious. Um, that could meet the functional description that you or I have. 
without being conscious. Um, and Bloch's point there was about qualitative states or raw fields or immediate phenomenological properties. The thing you get when you get an Indian burn or a Chinese burn or whatever you call it, that you don't, the, the thing doesn't have that. And what I'm suggesting is these two problems for the scientific study of the mind are connected. There's a problem about how you can give a scientific account of what it is to understand a language. There's a problem about how you can give a scientific account of what it is to be conscious. And these are connected. The reason it's so hard to give a scientific account of what it is to understand a language is that understanding a language depends on consciousness. Consciousness is really the fundamental problem here. OK, on that bombshell, let me <laughs> pause for a second. If that seems at all complex, I really encourage you to, to pause me and say, what, even if it's just to say, what the hell was that? <laughs> I mean, p p uh, p please, this is a review session. This is meant to be helpful. So don't let this just wash over. Plain as day? Yes? Um, didn't Gary write an article about... Sorry? Um, you read an article? Yeah, about how they've like, created robots that are capable of um, like getting around obstacles? Absolutely, yeah. Like, so what does that make a robot aware of its surroundings? Well, th 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 that is really a key thing. Um, um, so you've got, you, you, you've got the robot um, just to... Uh, uh, where's my robot? There you go. Um, <laughs> so you've got a robot, right? And let's suppose it does just fine. It gets around obstacles just fine. Yeah. Um, maybe it's like just a, a very handy to have around the house. You say, can you pass the pepper? And there you go. Passes the pepper. Yeah. Um, is you, you, so <coughs> is your sense that would be enough for the robot to be conscious? Well, it's aware of other things. Is that right? I mean, one of my colleagues has a room bot that um, navigates around his room, hoovering things up. Yeah. Yeah? yeah? Is that enough if it can just navigate around obstacles? It's actually yeah. amazing. It, <laughs> it navigates around obstacles just fine. Yeah? Maybe that doesn't help you Yeah, I mean, if it is just a mechanism like that, is that, how could that really be enough for consciousness? Right. Yeah? Um, but... More importantly, the question is, does getting the thing to be conscious, do you have to get the thing to be conscious to get it to understand language? Suppose you can get the robot to be conscious, then surely that would be enough for an understanding of language, if it could also do the, com the computational thing. Yeah. Um, but if you couldn't get the robot to be conscious, would that mean it didn't understand language? What was your hunch? Actually, what do, what, do, what do you guys think in general? Put it, 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 if you couldn't, if you could, you, you see what the problem is, though, the question is, if you couldn't get the robot to be conscious, could you nonetheless get it to understand language, to understand English or Chinese? Can you put your hand up if you think the answer is yes? Um, actually, you couldn't get it to understand. <laughs> I'm not yes. <laughs> Let me try and rephrase that. Um, if you cannot get the computer, yeah, uh, I don't think there's, any, there's no other way to put it, but that's okay. If you cannot get the thing to, un, to be conscious of what's outside it, yeah? So let's suppose it stays just a zombie from the point of view of consciousness, but it's very complicated and it can hold a conversation. Could it nonetheless understand language? Put up your hand if you think the answer is yes. It could understand language even if it wasn't conscious. And put out your hand if you think the answer is no. If it wasn't conscious, that would be an obstacle to an understanding language. Aha. Uh -huh. That's my hunch. I, I, um, that um, um, oh, we, will, we will come back to this, yeah? When you say consciousness, you just equate that to Yeah, I mean experience of your surroundings. Yeah. It can't be just an ability to differentiate, because I, I, it wouldn't take long to build a computer that could do that. 
a need to build a robot that could differentiate in some sense. You just point it at this and it goes eep. You point it at that and it goes bop. You, you see what I mean? You could do that. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I don't know a definition here, but um, the warm, buzzing, blooming confusion of everyday sensory experience, you know, that's what I mean. This rush of sensation that you have at the moment. Right? That would be part of the picture, yeah. That would be an element of the picture, yeah. Uh, there's quite a lot of people. Yeah. W were you raising a question? Yeah. It does experience everything or it doesn't. That it has some sort of way to remember, like you say, like you would look at each chalk. Yeah. Like You could absolutely do that. Of course you can do that. You're right. Uh, um, but the thing is, practically anything is capable of learning from its past encounters with the environment. You can, um, you, a decapitated cockroach will learn. You know, you can condition a decapitated <laughs> cockroach. Um, that, uh, <laughs> I'm not suggesting you try this at home, but <laughs> it's really striking how pervasive the ability to learn is. Yeah, even among things that you really wouldn't want to call conscious at all. So a robot would be capable of lots of complex learning. Yeah, but whether that's enough for consciousness is a further question. And on the other hand, I, it seems to me I could have a lot of sensation, but really not be very good at rem remembering things. Yeah, as age advances, you find that <laughs> that's not just a thought experiment. You know, that's really what's going on. Uh, you, you don't learn too much anymore, but <coughs> you, you still have the experience, the consciousness of what's going on around you. You see what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I guess this part is like part of understanding everything, because like in understanding the microwave, it is understanding the uh, relating back to transportation and reality. And like right. The, the way we're thinking of it right now, in line with Cell, is understanding is knowing what the words stand for, right? Knowing what they refer to, that's what understanding is. Yes? What was the question about the, the best all understanding means like that means the object recognition of physical robots uh -huh. understanding. Does it? Uh-huh. Well, like Very good. Okay, the, I, I see where you're going. That would be a good way to defend the idea that the robot might not be conscious, but it could understand. Because you're going to say that's enough for understanding. Yeah? Yeah. Um, well, l l let me give you an example here. Um, it, 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 have you guys come across blind sight? Can you put up your hand if you've heard of blind sight? Yeah. One blind sight? But okay. Uh, well, it, it doesn't, but practically nobody. <laughs> um, blind sight is a, a, a condition where people get a bash on the back of the head. They, they, they have damage to... Um, um, their visual system in the brain. And so one half of the visual field has nothing in it. There's no experience in one half of the visual field. OK? So um, with patients with this damage to um, the visual cortex, what uh, experimenters did was you put an object into the blind field, say a piece of paper like this, an edge like this, and you say, is that thing in your blind field upright or, hori or horizontal? What orientation is it? Is it like this or like that? And what does the blind sight patient say? The blind sight patient says, I've no idea. I can't see a thing, right? And the experimenter says, look, we'll give you $5 if you guess. Um, so the, um, the blind sight patient guesses, and they reliably get it right. They're not perfect, but they're well above chance. And uh, this has been um, really deeply explored. I mean, there have been, must be thousands now of experiments run on, on, on the, the handful of blind sight patients there are. Um, they spend their lives being tested, right? Can you do this? Can you do that? And there is really significant visual information coming in without any conscious awareness at all. So suppose you have someone like that, right? Just amp it up a little bit. Suppose that when, you, when I said, this is Jackson, 
or this is Austin, you are in the position of a blind sight patient. Or if I said, this is the screen here, right? And you couldn't, see, you couldn't experience the thing at all. But they said, now, um, am I showing you the screen or am I showing you a piece of chalk? Guess. And you say, well, I don't know. I've, um, I've no experience of either. And they said, yeah, but guess. Um, and you guess right. You were reliably right every time. You'd be in the position of the robot. You don't have any experience of what's going on around you. But you are reliably discriminating things. Yeah? So in that situation, do you know what the words you're using stand for? Do you know what you mean when you say Jackson or Austin? Do you know what you mean when you say screen? And your hunch is, and th this is an important, uh, your hunch is, yes, of course you know. Because you can do the discriminations. Yeah? My hunch is, I don't think you have any idea what's going on. Um, I think that's what you'd say. I have no idea what's going on. They keep giving me five dollars. They keep saying you got that right. Um, but what this is all about, I have no idea. I don't know what any of these words stand for. I don't know who these people, Jackson, I'm sorry, <laughs> you don't mind me using these examples. I don't know who these people, Jackson, Austin, and so on, are. I don't know what you mean when you say, that's what you'd say if you're in that situation. Um, so I go with the guys who said, if it's not conscious, then it doesn't know what the words stand for. Yeah, but I do see the importance of this um, other, other line. Yeah, it is an important other line. And it's important partly because the machine intelligence approach <coughs> seems hopeless if what I'm saying is correct. Yeah, it only, it's only going to work if you're right. So there's a lot, of <laughs> a lot at stake here in, in this issue. Yeah. Anyone else on that? It's plain as day. Let me ask again, if it's not conscious, could it know what the words stand for? Can you put your hand up if the answer is yes? If it's not conscious, could it know what the words stand for? If it's not conscious, it wouldn't know what the words stand for. Put, up, put your hand up if you think that. OK, so I, I would say that's about four to one at this point. Um, but we'll see. Uh, we, we will come back to this. OK, so um, I think that's all about the Chinese room. OK. With that, we wave goodbye to the Chinese room. Or I do, anyway. Um, uh, we'll really turn to it next week. Um, OK, so let's look at how we got here. I want to suggest that um, a lot of the um, puzzles about the mind, think, well, I mean, the, the puzzle is, what is the mind? How do we think about what the mind is? Um, and a lot of the puzzles come from how strange our knowledge of the mind is. Um, and you take it for granted the way you know about your own mind, the way you know about other people's minds. But it is really a strange phenomenon. It is not at all like your knowledge of physical objects. And Descartes really put it with a kind of thunderous clarity when he said, look, you have that certain knowledge of your own mind that you don't have of um, the existence of any other thing. Um, you know what your own mental states are in a way that you don't know about the existence of anything else. As Royal put it, describing Descartes' view, the person has no direct access to, of any sort to the events of the inner life of another. Absolute solitude is in this showing the ineluctable destiny of the soul. Only our bodies can meet. Um, so you've got your own mind, and you have that really certain knowledge of it, you have practically no knowledge of anyone else's mind. That's a natural picture, right? Can you put your hand up if you think that's correct? Oh, boy. OK, one, two, three. OK, not, not a big percentage. If you think that's wrong, I see. If you, know what the, if you have no idea what the question is, <laughs> OK, if you just don't know, if you find that very puzzling, Come on, that, that, there aren't any other options. <laughs> yes? Yes, of course. Yeah. You, you, I see, I see, yes. You could say that you have certain knowledge of your own existence, but, say, but deny that you don't know about anyone else's. <laughs> you could accept that you have certainty, a peculiar certainty about your knowledge of your own mind, 
but still think you have knowledge of other people's minds too. Yeah? Is that the popular option? Can you put your hand up if you think that's right? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. Okay. Yep. Is the right <coughs> is well, th that is an issue. You know, does the behavior give you direct access or not? Is it only guesswork? What's going on in someone else's mind? I mean, what I was suggesting with um, when I went through these examples, remember that thing about doing long division in the board where you're watching someone else think? What I was arguing there was that the behavior is really direct access because the thinking is right out there visibly on the board. You know, the, 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 that was, you, you might agree or disagree, but that was my point, that if I'm doing a calculation in the board, then you're seeing exactly what I'm thinking. If I make a mistake, you can see exactly where I went wrong. If I say five and four, eight, the, you know, if I write the five, the four, and the eight, then you can see exactly what happened. It's not like I really made a mistake back in my mind, or I really got it right back in my mind, and then it was just what happened in the board that went wrong. All the thinking was going on on the board, or in a conversation, you're hearing what the other person is thinking. Yeah, when we are talking right now, we hear what the other person is thinking. I think, I think that's right. You access the other person's mind in accessing, accessing their behavior. But again, there is another point of view that says, no, the mind is always hidden behind the behavior. And if you think of the inverted spectrum, yeah, then you might say, well, I don't know what the other person's color experiences are. I get their behavior is like mine, but really what's going on right inside their mind, I have no idea. Yeah. So there are, there are different lines to take there. Yeah, there's a lot of pull to all of these ideas. Um, but it's a powerful picture that a lot of the mind can be exhibited in behavior. I think thinking is the most obvious example. Um, but there are also things like whether you're kind or generous, I mean, can you really look at, would Descartes really want to say, I can look inside my mind and tell how kind and generous I am. Yeah, I always, um, if someone asks me for money, I always just say, get a job. Um, but in here, I'm very kind and generous. It just doesn't, it just never shows up in my behavior. Or you, you, know, you might say of someone, he was very, very intelligent, but he just never showed any sign of it. <laughs> That's yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, but isn't it also possible to like think or feel something inside of you, but then not not behave that way? You can hide it. That's right. You can you can hide your heart away. That's certainly possible. You, you can hide your feelings. Sure. Um, I agree with that. The, I should have put this. There's a bad case for other people and a good case. There's a bad case where you hide stuff from them. There's a good case where you, ex you, you, you let them see what your feelings are. Yeah. That's what I meant about the calculation, that I can, do the, I can do mental arithmetic, and if I'm just plunged in thought, doing a long division in my head, you have no idea what's going on. Yeah. I can keep it a secret, but when I do it in the board, you are really seeing the whole thing. Yeah. And similarly, if you exhibit your feelings op openly, um, that's what I was suggesting. The other people can really be seeing all there is that's going on in your mind. It, it, it's just the one and the same thing can be done now openly, now in secret. It's not that it's always being done in secret, and then there are just occasional behavioral manifestations of it. Uh, things are hotting up. Yeah, one, one two, three. Yeah, yeah. yeah correct. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Right. I do know what you mean, yeah. Yeah, well, okay, I, 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 I hammed it up when I was saying in secret or letting everyone see. There can be cases where, you know, as you say, you're just daydreaming or something. You know, It's not that you have something to hide. Um, and there again, well, it can happen that other people find out exactly what's in your mind. If you give free vent to it, you know, you're daydreaming and suddenly a thought strikes and you blurt it out. Yeah, yeah that can happen. Um, so... Uh, yeah, that's the thing. They can all be openly exhibited in behavior. So that picture, um, absolute solitude is the ineluctable destiny of the soul. That really does not seem to be right. Yeah? Uh, yeah.
Yes. Uh, you're kind of saying that at the moment they're not, they're not really realizing that Jesus came and he just came. Yes. I just want to bring up that last weekend in school today, we lost this player in the middle of the game. And he uh-huh. played the whole game and didn't know that Jesus was even going to line that weekend. Wow. Not, okay. Not That's a great story. Where, 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 where was that? Uh, NFL, one of the cornerbacks for Team America just picked you up. Uh, is, is, is it, I mean, wh- uh, it's, it's on the web. I can find it on the web. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. That's great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. Um, for clarification, are you saying that you find out about yourself, your interactions with people, and then you find out about Jesus all about In some cases, you do, yes. Right. This is against Descartes' view, yeah. Descartes' view is each of us has associated with our body a particular think bubble, and you can look inside your own think bubble and see exactly what's going on there. But other people's think bubbles are not directly accessible to you. You have to go via the body, and that only gives you an uncertain inference as to what's going on back there. I'm saying that's a much more realistic kind of picture. Right, but, but that's a hard thing to get to with Descartes, right? Like that there was really like that thing. You can you can like stay in the same kind of like same diet or whatever, but you you don't have, you're not you can doubt that they're are even existing things. You can doubt that they're existing. You can do that, but I, all, all, all I mean is if everything's cooperating I mean if they really exist and you really uh, they really are doing the stuff you think they're doing, their whole mind <laughs> They can be showing you exactly what's in their mind, in their behavior. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so you can see someone being generous, and it's actually the generosity you get. If someone exhibits a great sense of humor, you can you, you can see that. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't agree with analytical behaviorism, but uh-huh. I would think of a counterargument here as well. It's a great start. I don't agree with analytical behaviorism, but. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, carry on. That's great. <laughs> it's really good. But um, couldn't you argue that the, okay, it's hard to explain, but the um, action that you do to hide a mental state yes. could be behaviors of a, sp- of a different mental state, the mental state being um, trying to hide your mental state? Absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly what a behaviorist would have to say. But you got these pretend right. cases. And the, the, someone like Descartes thinks in the pretend case, what you've got is the mental state, um, but no behavior, and you just kind of subtracted something. But the behaviorist is going to say, what, what you said is really excellent, that this is actually a very complicated mental state here. Being in pain, but pretending you're not. Right. That's the mental state, not wanting anyone to know. And if you had that mental state, how would you exhibit that in behavior? By biting your lip and smiling cheerfully. <laughs> you know, that's, that's exactly what you'd do if you were in that complex mental state. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think that's a very good um, uh, point. The, 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 that's exactly what a, an analytical behaviorist should say. So an analytical behaviorist really pushes this stuff to the hilt yeah, and says all we're ever talking about when we talk about the mind is complexes of behavior. And if you're pretending or trying to keep something a secret, that's a still more complex mental state, um, issuing in really actually particularly complicated behavior. And it can be hard for other people to know exactly what kind of behavior they're encountering. But that's all that's going on. They don't know how to classify your behavior. It's always behavior that's being classified when we talk about the mind. Yeah, yeah. And the problem for analytical behaviorism was the um, super Spartans. Remember Put? Dear old, the dear old Super Spartans, remember the Super Spartans? Mm-hmm. Yep, um, happy days when we first encountered the Super Spartans, um, who for generations have been bred so that uh, they never exhibit pain in their behavior, and they never want to. Um, the, I think that's a really good point. That, 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 that's really, it's hard for a behaviorist to get around that. There might be no connect to behavior there. Um, but what I was suggesting in that class was um, it, you, don't, you have to be careful how hard you push that point too. Because if you say 
maybe people have been bred so they don't exhibit their pain in their behavior, then you, you could also have people being bred so they don't even internally attend to their behavior. They're all like this football player. They just focus on the job in hand. Whatever jolts of agony they're getting, they don't attend to that. And then you get to the point where you think, maybe we could all be like that right now. Maybe a few thousand years ago, humans were bred so as not to attend to their pain. So that actually, we all have icebergs of pain going on in us now at the moment. Um, and we only notice the very tip of the iceberg, but the pain is there. Right? So maybe everyone in this room at the moment is experiencing unimaginable pain. It's just you don't notice it and you don't exhibit it in your behavior. Hello? Is that a crazy idea? Yes, yes that is a crazy idea. Yes? yes? Can you put your hand up if you think that's a crazy idea? If you think that's not, that makes perfect sense? I, 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 that's really good. Do you, do you want to elaborate? Is any, any of you guys want to elaborate? Yeah. Yeah, if you're not feeling it, then it's not there. Yeah, the, 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 that's a view on the other side. Yeah. Yes. Right. Well, th that's what I think. Yeah. Yeah. Th I, th I think that fits very well with the last comment. Yeah. Y y it hardly makes sense to suppose that there's, there's this massive pain going on, but it's making no difference to you. Uh, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, th that is the picture. That is the picture that the last questioners were saying um, doesn't make sense. Yeah. Because how could it be all buried? You know, so you don't, if, if, it's not, if you don't feel it in the sense of knowing that you've got it, then it's not there. <coughs> yeah. But th that is the issue. I don't think it's an obvious issue, that one. Um, I don't think it can be right that we're all in a sea of pain at the moment. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, th 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 that's against the last comment. Yeah, yeah. It, that's not playing with language. That's making a very definite point, right? The language doesn't let you say that. I'm in great pain, but I just don't feel it. What? <laughs> right. but, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a mistake to say that you can be in this pain but not feeling it. Yeah. To have the pain is to feel it. Anything else? That, do you want to comment on that? No? Okay. 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 Have they done experiments where they perform, like, I mean, I don't know if this would necessarily be legal, but, like, <laughs> 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 would you, like, <laughs> like that commercial where the guy smashes the cars equally bad. It's an yes. insurance commercial, and then he's like, "You have the two different insurances, so you save money on one." Like, if it's two people, do they react the same way based on like the same amount of pain always? Do you know what I, do you I know do know what you mean. Thing? The thing is, it's very hard to know how to how to measure how much pain someone is feeling independently of how they react to it. Right. Do you see yeah. what I mean? Um, what would you do to, st how much would you pay to stop this pain? You, you, you see what I mean? Uh, it's very hard to know what measure there is of how much pain someone's feeling so that you could make sense of the possibility of differences in how they react to the very same quantity of pain. What about yeah. even like, there's, there's like, they could be feeling a different amount of pain in response to the same um, amount of... You could assume that if I, <laughs> yeah, if I cut you, a little bit, <laughs> I'll get more, right? Um, but the thing is that you, you're all, I, if you get differences in reaction to different, to, to um, the same physical injury, um, or uh, uh, electronic shocks or something, then um, there are always going to be two interpretations. One is it was the same amount of pain produced in both people, 
but they reacted very differently to it. The other would be how fascinating we found that in different people, the very same electrical stimulation can cause different amounts of pain. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's going to be very hard to make that distinction. Um, yeah, the last Sorry, one. Yeah. I have one more question. So if they did react differently, uh, yes. hypothetically, if they were saying... Yes, suppose they reacted differently to the same why input. Why would that be? Well, there would have to be some difference in the brain. Yes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there's only one world, and it's a physical world. If two physical systems, like the hands and uh, input cells of these two people, are behaving differently, something physically different must have gone on in the middle. Yeah, unless they're kind of random systems, I mean, r systems with some kind of randomizer in. But if you're getting systemic differences between the two people, there must be something systemic different, systemically different going on in the middle, right? Yeah, if there are two physical, uh, the whole of science is built around that idea. I mean, it's one thing to question how much science can tell you about the mind, but whoa, <laughs> it's, it's not wrong from start to finish. Yeah, okay. Okay, last one. Yeah. Okay, well, remember we talked about the different species? Do you think these trials are trying to say humans are possessing the idea that that's what they're like, they're like always in pain, that's why they're always crying, and then like as they get older, yeah. Yeah. There really are terrible cases like that where children just get very young children just get used to chronic pain, but it's very hard to know exactly what's going on. If someone's gotten used to managing pain, is that the same thing as not feeling the pain? Well, all you care about here is their perspective. I mean, <laughs> if you're kind of cold-hearted to and says, well, from my perspective, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> if you see what I mean, what, what you care about is the child's, what it's like in the child's perspective. Yeah, yeah. Um, OK. Um, so we got to analytical behaviorism. And then we said, well, um, and maybe it's the brain. Right? Maybe being in pain is a brain state that the super Spartans can have, even if they're not exhibiting any, um, uh, any pain behavior. Um, and then the problem for that kind of picture is variable realizability. You remember our old friend variable realizability? So um, you can make an octopus that feels pain. You could have um, a Martian that feels pain. Um, you don't have to have exactly the biology of a human being in order to feel pain. So you could make different physical systems that all feel pain. So it can't be that some one particular bit of biology is required in order to feel pain. But as people in the class said when this point came up, um, what matters is not what the particular physical system you have is. What really matters is how it's wired up to the rest of the system. Yeah. Uh, central tape materialism is the pain is C fiber firing thing. Yep. Yeah. Yes? Just out of curiosity, does the philosophy of time evolve in this order? Uh, yes. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I, th I think it's fair to say that the philosophy of mind actually evolved in exactly this order. Yeah. Uh, uh, with pretty much these arguments. Jackson, uh, Austin, is that? Right? I, th I think that's right. Th that's pretty much the way it went. I'm summarizing about 50. It took people a long time to think of these things. You know, I'm telescoping it now, but really it took a long time to think through these things. And but, um, uh, but yeah, it, it's possible to go over it pretty rapidly now. But um, uh, th that was these were the key points. Uh, yes, well, th th that's a fair w way to put it. Is the, the argument against central state materialism like that is it's speciesistic, if you see what I mean. It supposes that humans would be unique in having the kind of minds that we do. But of course there could be other species with different kinds of brain structures, uh, or maybe no brain structures at all, that still have um, our kinds of minds. 
That was the argument about variable realizability. It seems to make perfect sense. Yeah? Is this something that can be functional? Absolutely. This is a key. This is uh, probably the key argument. Well, one key argument for functionalism. Yeah, it's the key argument for functionalism, I think. Um, so it's a very important argument um, that uh, what matters is not what it's made of, but how it's hooked up to the other stuff. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Even if you thought I'm only interested in human brains, um, you would still be interested in functional organization. I mean, wh wh a scientist who's trying to understand what's going on with the visual system in the brain is going to want a box and arrow chart diagram of what all the bits are doing. Yeah. Even if they say, well, I've never really thought about octopuses or Martians or any of that stuff. Y you see what I mean? So even if you weren't impressed by variable realizability, you still might be a functionalist. Yeah. But this is one of the decisive arguments, though it seemed to many people decisive anyway, that um, uh, made functionalism look compelling. Uh, quickly. Sorry, I just confused. So are you saying that variable realizability is a key argument for functionalism? Yes, I'm saying variable realizability is a key argument for functionalism. Yep, yep. Same question? Yep. Yeah, like, kind of what you mentioned when you said the know what's going on in their mind, but they can't really do it. Yes. And then, like, functionally you're saying, well, we have this feature of a landscape, and then, therefore, you don't know what they're doing. And you're kind of just assuming they were mental. You don't know what it is. No, functionalism is saying the way you find it, the way to find out what's going on in someone else's mind. So functionalism is saying is not what you make the thing of, is what it does, right? So it's like a switch. It's, it's, um, it's not what you make a switch of that makes it a switch. It's what it does in the system you put it into. Yeah? So um, you're characterizing the thing, by the, the, the mental state, by its inputs, by what outputs it gives of what inputs. You, th that's all very clear at this point. Should I elaborate that? Any, anyone not remember what this means? Yeah, who said I don't remember? Did someone say I don't remember? Don't be shy. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Um, so finding out about, oh, finding out about someone else's mental states is a matter of finding out about their functional structure. So it's not saying that mental states are always hidden. Um, it's a bit like if you took the electrical system in this room, you want a functional characterization of the electrical system in this room, then you could find out about that by testing it, by seeing what happens when you put on various switches, by seeing what happens when you put the switches on in different combinations by seeing what happens when you take the power out um, here or there. Um, so finding out about someone else's functional structure is a matter of finding out about internal states that they have. But you could do that by pushing their buttons, by testing them in various ways, just the same way you could explore what the electrical system is. Um, and uh, the way we do this in practice is either explicit you can say, you could actually try drawing a flowchart for one of your friends. You could say, um, mention Sally and he always gets grumpy. You, you, you see what I mean? Um, unless he's just had some good news or whatever, yeah? Um, or you can say about someone, he's a fiend when he's drunk. Um, and there you're explicitly drawing the box and arrow diagram. Yeah, you see what I mean? Um, uh, or else, it can be the way that you get to know someone else as a basketball player. You just played against them a lot, and you know how to, f how to lead them astray. You know how to get past them. Um, you know when they're going to beat you. Because um, um, you've just learned how to work with them. And that's what we do, it seems to me, with each other the whole time. You just get to know how to work with someone else. Um, and that's a matter of getting their functional structure how to push their buttons. But it's not something that you necessarily write down explicitly. It's something you just do. Yeah.
Infinite is a lot. Yeah. Very large. Is Yes. Yeah. 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 That is important. It's uh, 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 um, the, the writer Borges says somewhere about one of his characters. He says, um, like all individuals, he was fathomless. And you know that feeling that someone else is, I, I, I remember um, someone saying to me about his wife of 40 years, you know, I look at her sometimes and I think, I have no idea what's going on with you. Um, and, um, you know, you, you, you know that feeling that you, 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 you can have a family member you've known your entire life and just be struck by how alien they seem, you know, how little you understand of them, really, of what is going on. Um, and it, it's an important... I don't know. I, I don't know quite how you make that explicit. It's an important idea that that you couldn't catch someone by a box and arrow diagram. There are always going to be more boxes and arrows than you could capture. And I think that sort of has a bionic kind of instruction to sort of act naturally. Yes. I think that's an important sense. I, I think, though, that the brain is very, very complex. I mean, the brain is the most complex physical system known, I think. Um, and um, w when you chart however many trillion connections there are in the brain, yeah, that's go it's not going to be infinite, but it is going to be very, very big. <laughs> and um, it really, I think that the, the hope must be that that complexity is really, it's just a matter of complexity. It's really very, very big, but it's not actually completely unmanageable. But I think there's like a level of creativity that you can't reach. Yeah. That may be true, but it may not be true. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, the artificial intelligence guys are going to say to you, that is just a matter of brute complexity. Yeah. The way you thought you couldn't make someone that could play, t a, a machine that could play chess successfully. Yeah. That was just the first thing to crack, yeah. And then the rest is just more complexity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. It's meant to be an alternative to central state materialism. And from the functionalist point of view, the central state materialist is like the guy that says, well, a switch has got to be made of copper and bakelite. And they're just making a mistake. That's not what makes it a switch. Yeah. You're going to make up something. But it doesn't really matter what particular thing you make it of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, functionalism, it, it's, it's like saying that an electrical circuit is something physical. Yeah. Um, so an electrical circuit, it's not like there's some people are dualists about electrical circuits, right? But an electrical circuit is always physical. But um, what makes it a switch is not what it's made of, but what it does. Yeah, that's the important thing. So similarly, you could say humans are always completely physical, but what makes it that they have passions and pains, that they feel anger and hurt, um, what makes that so is not what they're made of, but how they're wired up. Yeah, D does that make sense? So it's not something, it's not what their physical constitution is that's the important thing, it's how it's wired up. So it's a more abstract thing than that basic thing. Yeah. So could you be a dualist and a functionalist? Yes, very good. Yeah, that's absolutely it. You could say um, uh, it's, it's, it's like variable realizability. Um, you, could, you could make a mind out of an octopus's style brain, out of a ma mushroom silicon style brain, or a human biological brain. But you could also make a mind out of ectoplasm. Uh, yeah, the, uh, yeah, excellent question. Yeah. OK. Um, okay, so from the functionalist is going to say that knowledge of someone else's mind is a matter of knowledge of their functional structure. And that's really, I don't know, it, whether it's right or wrong, it's certainly incredibly important in everyday life. 
that you be able to work with other people's functional structures. Um, I gave that uh, uh, analogy of the way you could know uh, how another basketball player works, the functional structure of a basketball player. You could do that explicitly or just by being able to play successfully with them. Okay, so that's how we got to functionalism. Any questions about that? Yep. The mind is the functional structure. That's, it's a bit like asking, where's the electrical system? Well, it's there in the cabling. But what makes it the electrical system is the way the cabling is all hooked up together. And it's that it's exhibited as, yeah, how, how it's shown to everybody else is usually through behavior. But in principle, you could track functional structure by looking at um, um, imaging in the brain. So seeing what bits of the brain light up when the person looks at something. Yeah. There'd be uh, lots of different ways you could get at functional structure. The way we do it usually is through behavior, through interaction. It's not just behavior. You're not just passively observing. We test each other the whole time. We interact with each other the whole time. You try saying some, this to somebody to see how they react. Yeah? Uh, are they shocked or what? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, one, yeah. One, two. Yeah. So, yeah, you, yeah, so, yes, yes, yes. Uh, the, co the, the behaviorist would say the important thing is if it's passing the Turing test. Yeah, if you can't tell whether it, uh, the, the behavior is exactly the same as a regular speaker's, then that understands. Yeah, um, so uh, it wouldn't even require the same functional structure. It would just say if, if it manages to get out the same responses see, as, a, as a regular person would have, that's good enough. Yep. Uh, Uh, yes, I, I, I don't know what, exactly what you mean, a logical chain. It's certainly a chain, right? The outputs are, well, the, the outputs, that's what makes them outputs, right? The that's what makes them inputs, right? The, the one causes the other, yeah? Um, there could be loops, yeah? It's entire, I mean, and surely there are loops, yeah? I, I, um, <coughs> I'm suffering from insomnia, which is a mental state, yeah? So when I go to bed, I worry about my insomnia, and that keeps me awake. Yeah, which makes me worry about my insomnia. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and so we go round and round, yeah. Um, so there sort of can certainly be loops. It's not necessarily a, a linear chain. Yeah. Um. Okay, consciousness. Consciousness. You remember our old friend, the inverted spectrum? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, so um, what uh, you see when you look at that is what I see when I look at that. <coughs> what um, you see when you look at this is what I get when I look at that. Yeah, that kind of idea? Yeah. That our spectrums might be just as discriminating as one another, um, but um, uh, um, uh, your experiences intrinsically are quite different. So. These two people could be, I mean, people who are having quite different experiences could be functionally exactly the same. Yeah? There's something about the nature of experience that's not being captured by functionalism here. You could know someone else's functional structure perfectly well. You can interact with them. We can interact with each other perfectly successfully, but still wonder, well, I don't know whether you're having this kind of experience or that kind of experience. And it makes no difference to your functional structure. Or with a split brain patient, you could say, well, I know what's going on with this guy functionally perfectly well, but I have no idea what his conscious experience is like. Yeah? Could you um, Yeah. Right. Right. Can that, uh, is that the same as just the colors, or is that just like where you're in the I think that's different okay. because you'd be functionally different in what you could do uh -huh. I, I, w w with the lenses and without. Okay. Yeah. 
So um, uh, the thing about the inverse the inverse spectrum is, um, I mean, if one of them, if, if this guy can drive, then this guy can drive. Yeah, I mean, the colors are just the same. Yeah, uh, I mean, what I mean is the behavior is just the same. The outputs are just the same. Yeah, um, but with the lenses, it doesn't follow that one of them. If with the lenses you can drive, it doesn't follow that without the lenses you can drive. You, you, you see what I mean? You're functionally quite different. Yeah. Um, Spectrum inversion with a black and white shape. Uh, 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 no, so, uh, that's wait a minute. That's not black and white. Well, yeah, no, no, no. It's like black usually and white. Yeah, it's oh, I see what you all mean. All yeah, everything switched. Yeah, yeah. But there are lots of different possible mappings of the colors you could try out here. It's actually technically quite difficult to get a good inverted spectrum. Yeah, to, to, to get, you, you can map the reds onto the greens and the um, yellows onto the blues, but whether or not you can really successfully make an, 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 an inverse spectrum is um, a significant technical challenge. Steve Palmer um, in the psychology department here has spent a while on that exercise trying to show how you could do a good map of one spectrum onto another. Yeah, and um, he thinks, yes, it can be done, but if f f for detail on that, there's this article by Byrne and Verted Qualia in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Do you guys know the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy? Yeah. 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 Okay. It, it, that is absolutely state of, you, you, not always, but usually that is state of the art on anything you want to read. Um, anything you want to Google up on Stanford Encyclopedia, you'll find good reading on. Yeah. Um, okay, this guy, you understand functionally, but there's something, again, elusive about his conscious states, right? W you remember this guy, you can predict just what he's going to do. You can predict the kind of thing he's going to say. But you don't understand what his conscious experience is. So there's again something about conscious experience that's eluding functional understanding. Um, so you know the functional structure, but you still don't know what kind of visual experience he's having. You don't know um, uh, how to explain in functionalist terms what it is that seems to be so puzzling about this guy. There's nothing that's puzzling about this guy um, functionally. You don't know how to explain in functionalist terms what it would take to, um, uh, to have a unitary point of view. I can't remember, did we discuss the example of honeybees before? I don't think we did. Sorry? No, um, so suppose you think about the way scientists study honeybees. Honeybees are very intensively studied. Yeah, um, most re they, they have great navigational abilities. They come, they, they go out and they look for um, pollen, and then they come back to their hive and they do a dance for the other bees to tell them where the pollen is. Um, and uh, the other bees make kind of intelligent use of this information. Um, the one set of experimenters manipulated their honeybee, so it came back and told the other honeybees the pollen was in the middle of a lake. And the other honeybees just ignored <laughs> this. Um, they make intelligent use of a lot of information. And recently, I mean, just a few years ago, it was it's long been known that they are very good at navigating. They get to their hive. They get to the. They use um, this communication to get to the pollen um, really successfully. And a few years ago, they did this thing where um, the experimenters basically kidnapped the honeybees. They, you know, put them in the box and put them in the trunk of a car and drove them to a distant destination and then let them go. And the bees flew back and forth a little bit and oriented themselves and then they just flew straight for home. So they, they made a beeline <laughs> for home, uh, right? Now, that's telling you all that there is a lot of cognition there. Yeah, they have a map. They have a map of where the mountains are, where the lake is, where home is with respect to the mountains and the lake. They are using the sun as a compass. They are, they are um, flying about to orient themselves with respect to the mountains and the lake. And once they get that, they can use the map to plot the direct route home. So they have a lot of cognition. But are they conscious? <laughs> well, 
They're too small, right? How can they be conscious? I mean, how can something that small be conscious? Um, the, the, po the, the important point really is not whether they're <coughs> conscious or not, but the thing is that you can do this immense amount of scientific study of them um, without caring about whether they're conscious, right? It, it might not even occur to you that they're conscious, um, and, but you do the study as to how they get about. Now, suppose that Martian psychologists study us. Martian psychologists could study us just the way we study um, um, honeybees. They could say, look at them, marvelous little chaps. They navigate about the place in these little cars. They build all these roads. Just incredible. You wouldn't really think it. Um, but it might never have occurred to the Martians that we are conscious. Right? They just don't need to ask the question. They, they, they say soft, squashy things like that couldn't be conscious. Doesn't make any sense. Yeah? And maybe some Martians think, well, but maybe they are, but they're just regarded as sentimental, um, um, kind of very fairy nonsense, really, by everybody else, who just studies the way we cognize and the way we get about. Now, when you think about it, the way that scientific psychology studies humans is exactly the same way that Martian psychologists would be studying um, us or that we study the honeybees. Um, you look at reaction times, you look at what people can do, you look at their functional structure. You know all about the functional structure of the honeybee. You don't need to ask the question, is it conscious? You know all about the functional structure of the human. Um, you could do all that scientific study and say, is it conscious or not? Who cares? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Yeah? So there is something about the scientific study as such of an organism that seems to just miss out consciousness every time. And on that bombshell, we'll pause for today. Um, I have to stop a few minutes early today. And we'll um, pick up with Nagel uh, on Thursday. And good luck with the essay. OK, great questions. Thanks, guys.